I hope you are all really energized and ready for mumps. And uh, Dr. Moore, please lead us off. Good afternoon and welcome back to the Mumps Work Group session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this session. Uh, as has been presented at previous meetings in February and in June, the objective of the Mumps Work Group is to evaluate and propose policy options to prevent or control mumps outbreaks in the United States. Uh, we've had a number of activities related to this, including a review of the epidemiology, available evidence of the duration of immunity for mumps after vaccination, and available evidence on the impact of a third dose of MMR for mumps outbreak control, as well as an evaluation of programmatic uh, implications and cost of various policy options uh, for the use of a third dose of MMR to prevent or control mumps outbreaks. We've had a, a, a very, very active work group and appreciate tremendously the contributions of our varied group of, of experts here, and most especially Mona Marin, who's been our CDC lead on this and has worked tirelessly to get us everything we possibly could use to come up with a recommendation. Although evidence is not abundant when it comes to the third dose of an MMR vaccine for mumps control, we have sought it wherever it could be found. We have a wide variety of working group member areas of expertise from infectious disease to policy to modeling to disease control. We have organizations represented from state public health, academia, federal, and professional societies as well as college health and consumer protection groups. And then we have looked at both published data and unpublished data, including the collection of surveys to try to assess uh, opinions from students and parents, as well as getting feedback from health departments, universities, and getting data, additional data from health departments across the US, and we appreciate their contributions to our deliberations. After looking at all of this evidence, the work group assessment is that the scientific evidence is limited and insufficient at this time to fully characterize the impact of a third dose of mumps of MMR vaccine on reducing the size or duration of mumps outbreaks. However, we do agree that there is evidence available for a proposed recommendation to decrease the risk for mumps disease in persons at increased risk because of an outbreak. So during this session, We'll move to Dr. Marin, and get, she will give us an update on mumps epidemiology in the U.S. to date. Dr. Marlowe will review the grade for a third dose of MMR vaccine. Dr. Marin will then conclude with showing us considerations and proposed recommendations from the work group, followed by a vote and a VFC vote but with Dr. Santoli to close. Dr. Marin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for this presentation, I will be providing you with an update on the epidemiology of mumps in the United States. This figure shows the number of reported mumps cases in the United States during vaccine era. Since introduction of the vaccine program in 1977, the number of mumps cases has declined by approximately 99%. However, mumps outbreaks have been reported since 2006, resulting in the increase in the number of cases as shown in the inset. Since 2012, there has been an increasing trend in the case count, incidence, number of outbreak cases, proportion of outbreak-related cases among all reported cases, and number of jurisdictions reporting outbreak cases with 2016 having the highest number of cases overall, outbreak-related cases, and jurisdictions reporting outbreaks in a decade. Although preliminary, this trend appears to continue in 2017. As of October, the case count has reached more than 4,600. Incidence is lower than in 2016, but higher than any other year before 2016, Outbreak-related cases represent two-thirds of all cases, with 33 U.S. jurisdictions reporting outbreaks. The graph illustrates the number of cases shown by the bars and the incidence showing by the line from 2011 to 2017. 
In 2017, the highest incidence continues to be in young adults, 18 to 22 years of age, similarly to previous years, as shown by the hatched bars in the graph. The median age among mom's case patients is 21 years, of which 75% with known vaccination history have at least two doses of MMR vaccine. Next, I will describe the epidemiologic characteristics of mom's outbreaks and outbreak-associated cases that occurred between January 2016 and, July, and June 2017. CDC obtains information on mumps outbreaks in three ways, either by media reports, through direct phone call notification by jurisdictions, or through the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System, or NNDSS. While NNDSS uses case-based surveillance to monitor disease activity nationally, it is not always possible to determine the number or size of outbreaks that occur within or across jurisdictions. Considering these limitations, in July 2017, CDC requested that jurisdictions support enhanced surveillance and submit aggregate level outbreak data for MUMS to better characterize the burden of outbreaks nationally. We developed a MUMS outbreak data collection tool that was sent to all 50 states and two jurisdictions that transmit data to NNDSS. Jurisdictions were asked to report aggregate data from all individual outbreaks that met the CSTE case definition of three or more cases linked by space and time and occurred between January 1st, 2016 and June 30th, 2017. Outbreaks that began in 2015 but went through 2016 were also included in the data collection. The data collection tool consisted of three sections. Description of each outbreak, characteristics of case patients, and the control measures implemented during each outbreak, including use of an outbreak or third dose of MMR vaccine, which will hereafter be referred to as MMR3. The response rate was 98%, with only one jurisdiction not responding. From January 2016 through June 2017, 150 mumps outbreaks were reporting, accounting for 9,200 mumps cases. 39, or 76% of jurisdictions, reported at least one outbreak. The median number of cases per outbreak was 10, and the median age of case patients in these outbreaks was 21 years. Jurisdictions reported that an outbreak or third dose of MMR vaccine was used in 35 or 23% of all outbreaks. By setting, 75 or 50% of all outbreaks occurred in university settings, including outbreaks limited to sports teams and Greek organizations. Outbreaks in university settings accounted for more than 3,600 or 40% of all outbreak cases. Community settings accounted for 32% of all outbreaks with organized groups such as churches, work settings, parties, and fitness centers accounting for 25% of all out outbreak settings. Outbreaks in community settings accounted for more than 5,200 or 57% of all outbreak cases. Schools, including elementary, middle, and high school, accounted for 13% of all outbreak settings and household outbreaks accounted for only 5%. This table presents the distribution of reported outbreaks by size and median duration in days, as well as median age of case patients in each size group. 50% of all outbreaks reported consisted of three to nine cases, while 13% had 50 cases or more. These larger outbreaks accounted for 83% of all outbreak-related cases. 
As seen in the third column, as well as the graph, the median duration increased with increasing size of the outbreak, with outbreaks with 20 cases or more lasting more than three months. Regardless of size, the median age range was similar for each group and ranged between 17 and 21 years of age, as shown in the last column. This figure shows the distribution of outbreak setting by size of outbreak. University outbreaks, as shown by the hatched bars, were the most common setting regardless of outbreak size and ranged from 40% to 78%. Overall, of the 35 outbreaks where an outbreak or third dose of MMR vaccine was used, 24 or 69% occurred in universities. By setting, an outbreak or third dose of MMR vaccine was administered in 32% of outbreaks that occurred in universities, 19% of community outbreaks, 11% of other school outbreaks, and none in household settings. In the next couple of slides, I will present case, case patient level information for outbreak associated cases. Here we examined the number of ra and rate of complications by vaccination status. 350 case patients were vaccinated with three doses of MMR vaccine at the time of infection, with only two complications reported in this group, less than 1%. 5,015 case patients had two doses of MMR vaccine with 139 complications reported, approximately 2.8%. In total, 270 complications occurred among 9,200 case patients for a rate of 2.9%. This slide compares complication rates between the pre-vaccine era, published reports from 2006 to 2015, and data collected from these most recent outbreaks. In the pre-vaccine era, second column of the table, morbidity from complications was high. Published results, third column of the table, showed that the proportion of complications was much lower in the vaccine era than in the pre-vaccine era. The 2016-2017 mumps outbreak data, the far right column, further supports the conclusion that complications from mumps infection are much lower in the vaccine era. To conclude, mumps outbreaks continue to be a public health burden. Young adults between the ages of 17 and 21 are at highest risk of disease. Half of all outbreaks reported occurred in university settings. Also, although half of outbreaks were less than 10 cases, 13% had 50 cases or more and accounted for over 80% of all outbreak-associated cases. While complications do still occur, the rates of complications in vaccinated persons remain low. I would like to acknowledge all jurisdictions for participating in the investigation, as well as my um, uh, colleagues from the CDC MAMS team listed on the slide. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, questions for Dr. Marin? Yes, Dr. Reingold. So I probably know the answer to this, but is there any way to use the data you have to look at the question of whether vaccination uh, in response to an outbreak has any impact? Uh, that's what we're looking at. We collected the data. It's, yes, we're, it's an ongoing um, um, assessment. Other questions? Okay, I guess we'll move on to uh, Dr. Marlowe's presentation on grade. May I just provide a Nana? May I just provide a different answer to that question? Um, of course. I just, um, 
we will continue to look at the impact of vaccine on outbreaks, but if we expect there to, there to be a precise answer in a short time frame, we would be having this discussion once we had that data. And so we expect that it will be a analysis that we're going to be conducting over a long period of time as we accumulate additional evidence, because every outbreak is so different that it's really difficult to provide you a precise answer. And so um, it's true that we're working on it, but it's also true that if we waited this discussion for three months, we, we wouldn't have a precise answer for you. Since I'll be off the ACIP by then, you can mail me the results. <laughs>Good afternoon. This presentation will be on the grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation of a third dose of MMR vaccine. Here's an overview of the grade process, which includes the following steps. Develop policy questions, consider critical outcomes, review and summarize evidence of benefits and harms, and evaluate quality of evidence. I will present the MUMPS workgroup execution of these steps, shown in bold, in this presentation, the remaining steps will be discussed in the next presentation by Dr. Marin. The policy question for consideration is, should a third dose of MMR vaccine be administered to persons at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak? The population of interest is persons at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak. The intervention is a third dose of MMR vaccine. And the comparison is two doses of MMR vaccine. The outcomes the work group considered most important were mumps disease, complication of mumps disease, duration of protection, immune response, serious adverse events, and reactogenicity, considered here as non-serious local and systemic adverse events. Outcomes included in the evidence profile are divided into benefits and harms, and each given an importance level of critical or important. The work group deemed the benefits outcomes, prevent mumps disease, and prevent complications of mumps disease as critical, and duration of protection and immune response as important. The work group deemed the harms outcome, serious adverse events, as critical, and reactogenicity as important. We conducted a systematic review of studies in any language from PubMed, Embase, CNL, Cochrane, Scopus, and clinicaltrials.gov databases. Efforts were made to obtain unpublished or other relevant data. The search string used to obtain all articles potentially related to a third dose of MMR is provided here. Included articles presented primary data on a third dose of MMR vaccine as the intervention, at least one outcome of interest, and were not animal studies. This is, this is the schematic representation of our evidence retrieval process. Working with an expert in library sciences, we identified 394 references via database searches, 81 references from clinicaltrials.gov, and three unpublished articles or data sets. 478 titles and abstracts were pre-screened for exclusion, and 53 were identified for full text screening. We excluded 34 articles that did not report data on a third dose as the intervention, four that did not report on the outcomes of interest, one study that was conducted only in immunocompromised children, and three studies with results not yet reported or not found. 11 studies were considered in the grade analysis. For the grade analysis, the body of evidence is first assigned an initial evidence type based on the study design of included studies and ranked by the criteria listed in the table here, with one being the highest and four being the lowest. Following grade methodology, all observational studies start as evidence type three, the lowest, second lowest evidence type. It is worth noting that randomized controlled trials are challenging to conduct during mumps outbreaks due to ethical considerations. Now I will present the grading of the evidence for outcomes related to benefits of a third dose. The first outcome is vac vaccine effectiveness against mumps in third dose versus two dose vaccinees. Three cohort studies reported on this outcome. All studies were conducted in outbreak settings among populations with high two dose coverage. One study by Fibocorn et al. from 2013 reported attack rate 
but used a third dose for post-exposure prophylaxis among household contacts and was not included as part of the body of evidence for this outcome. This table summarizes the estimates of effect reported from the three studies, which included university students and school children aged 11 to 17 years and 19, 9 to 14 years. All studies reported a lower attack rate in third dose vaccinees compared with two dose vaccinees. Vaccine effectiveness at 21 to 28 days post vaccination ranged from 61% to 88%, and the VE estimate of 78% for university students was significant with a p-value less than 0 0.001. This estimate of effect was calculated using the hazard ratio and adjusted for 28 days post-vaccination and time since second MMR vaccination. The evidence type for third dose vaccine effectiveness against mumps is 4. The cohort studies were downgraded for serious risk of bias that included selection bias. The evidence was also downgraded for serious imprecision given estimates had large confidence intervals of which some included no effect. For outcome two, vaccine effectiveness against mumps complications, no studies reported on VE against mumps complications and we were not able to determine the evidence type for this outcome. For outcome three, duration of protection, no clinical studies reported on duration of protection, and we were not able to determine the evidence type for this outcome. For the fourth outcome, immune response, three repeated measure studies were evaluated. These studies compared pre-third dose antibody titers with post-third dose antibody titers at multiple time points. The first two studies listed here use serum samples from the same cohort, but different antibody detection methods. For immune response estimates of effect, this table shows the proportion of participants zero negative for mumps antibody titers at three time points, baseline or pre-third dose, up to and including one month, and over one month to 12 months post-third dose vaccination. The study used four antibody detection methods that included whole virus, nuclear protein, and hemagglutinin neuraminidase ELISAs, and plaque reduction neutralization assays. All studies showed a reduction in the proportion of persons with negative titers at one month post third dose vaccination. Though not shown here, antibody lever levels were also significantly higher at one month but then decreased to near baseline levels by one year. Since there is no correlate of protections for mumps, zero negative cutoffs were defined by each author and are not included here. The evidence type for the outcome immune response is four. The three repeated measure studies were downgraded for serious risk of bias that included potential selection bias. The studies were also downgraded for serious indirectness given there is no quote of protection for mumps. Immunogenicity was used as a proxy for effectiveness. Samples were tested against vaccine strain versus circulating strain antigens. And studies were conducted in non-outbreak settings. Now I will present the grading of the evidence for outcomes of potential harms. The one, one pre-post study and four case series studies reported on serious adverse events of a third dose of MMR vaccine. The two studies conducted in Orange County, shown in the bottom row, reported the same survey data and are considered as one study for this analysis. The bottom two studies listed here were cohort studies, but are considered case series for this outcome because the outcome was only reported for third dose vaccinees and not all participants. A serious adverse event, or SAE, is defined as death, life-threatening illness, hospitalization, or prolongation of existing hospitalization, or permanent disability. No SAEs were reported in 14,368 children and young adults vaccinated with a third dose. 
Two studies were based on passive reporting, and three studies actively surveyed vaccine recipients. In addition, no healthcare visits for vaccination-related symptoms were reported in any of the studies. No series criteria for downgrading were identified among the one pre- and post-study and the four case series studies. The evidence type for the pre-post study remained a three. When considered together, the case series studies were upgraded for strong strength of association given no cases were found among over 13,000 actively and passively surveyed third dose vaccinees. Together, the highest evidence type, two, is the overall evidence type for this outcome. Three of the studies that reported SAEs also reported on the sixth outcome, reactogenicity. The pre and post study was conducted among young adults, and the two case series studies were conducted among school children, aged 9 to 14 years and 11 to 17 years. This slide presents the estimates of effect for reactogenicity among young adults from the pre and post study that prospectively monitored adults aged 18 to 28 years. Episodes of 14 symptoms were solicited using daily diaries from two weeks before third dose vaccination to four weeks after third dose vaccination. Of these, four symptoms listed in the table here were significantly elevated among subjects after vaccination with a third dose compared with baseline. They included joint problems, headache, diarrhea, and swollen glands. The estimated net percent of vaccinees with one or more episodes attributable to a third dose vaccination are provided in the second column and range from 6 to 12 percent. And median duration of these symptoms was about two days. This slide presents reactogenicity estimates of effect for children that were observed in the two case series studies. For these studies, parents of children were retrospectively surveyed on symptoms their child experienced within two weeks post-third dose vaccination. The surveys were conducted two to four months after third dose vaccination campaigns. Among children aged 11 to 17 and 9 to 14 years, 6 to 7 percent experienced at least one symptom, and the most frequently reported symptoms were pain, redness, or swelling at injection site, joint ache, and dizziness, all which occurred in 2 to 4% of vaccinees. For the outcome reactogenicity, the pre and post study was downgraded for serious risk of bias from potential observer effect, and the two case series studies were downgraded for serious risk of recall bias. Together, the overall evidence type for this outcome is 4. Now I'll present the grade summary. This is the grade summary for a third dose of MMR vaccine versus two MMR doses for persons at increased risk for mumps disease because of an outbreak. The critical outcome of preventing mumps was supported by three cohort studies. Results from all studies suggested a third dose was effective at preventing mumps with one study demonstrating a significant effect. No studies assessed the effectiveness of a third dose to prevent mumps complications, and an evidence type was not determined for this outcome. No serious adverse events were observed in one pre- and post-study and four large case series studies. The evidence, evidence types supporting these critical outcomes are four for preventing mumps, not determined for preventing mumps complications, and two for serious adverse events. I would like to acknowledge the following colleagues and team members for their assistance and guidance on this project. The references are provided here. Thank you. Thank you for that nice presentation. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. I think we're going to go back to Dr. Marin. <coughs> Afternoon again. 
Um, I want to start by providing a context for this presentation. Uh, numerous mumps outbreaks have been reported in the United States since late 2015, with the majority occurring in university settings and young adults being at highest risk for mumps. CDC guidance for health departments for use of a third dose of MMR vaccine, referred to as uh, MMR3 in this presentation, has been available since 2012. At that time, data were insufficient to recommend for or against a third dose of MMR vaccine during mumps outbreaks. As we heard from various stakeholders, an ACIP recommendation would provide a more direct recommendation. The evidence is limited and insufficient at this time to fully characterize the impact of the third dose of MMR vaccine on reducing the size or duration of mumps outbreaks, but studies are ongoing to address this question. However, the MUMPS workgroup agrees evidence is available for a potential recommendation to decrease risk for MUMPS disease in persons at increased risk because of an outbreak. From this perspective, in this presentation, I will cover the remaining steps of the GRADE process highlighted in the slide for the policy question, should a third dose of MMR vaccine be administered to persons at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak? The steps I will be addressing include assess population benefit, evaluate values and preferences, considerations for formulating recommendations, and the work group's proposed recommendations. Health economic data will not be presented today. I will first present a summary of the evidence reviewed by the work group, followed by the work group's interpretation. We use the format of the draft ACIP evidence to recommendations framework to select factors important for developing recommendations and questions used to guide the work group's discussions. These factors include problem, benefits and harms, values, acceptability, and implementation. Starting with the problem. We reviewed burden of disease earlier during uh, this session. Therefore, for problem, I will only provide a brief summary of the evidence. The two-dose MMR childhood vaccination program led to significant decline in reporting mumps cases in the United States. Mumps can occur in persons vaccinated with two doses of MMR vaccine, or MMR2, but incidence is significantly lower in the two-dose era compared with pre-vaccine and one-dose eras. An increase in the number of cases and outbreaks has been observed since 2006. Outbreaks were reported in settings with high two-dose coverage and most occurred in populations with high contact rates that facilitate transmission, mainly universities. MUMS outbreaks are occurring in more U.S. jurisdictions in recent years. Outbreak control measures are resource intensive for institutions and public health. Severity of MUMS among two-dose vaccinated persons is reduced. Considering the evidence on burden of disease, the work group interpretation of the evidence is that outbreaks, as opposed to sporadic disease, are a public health priority for the MUMPS vaccination program. The work group then reviewed several lines of evidence to understand why this burden is occurring. Regarding two-dose MMR vaccine effectiveness for preventing of MUMPS, the summary of the evidence reviewed by the work group includes the median two-dose mumps vaccine effectiveness is 88%, with a range of estimates of 31% to 95%. Most studies included persons with the second dose of MMR received less than 10 years prior. The 31% estimate is from the Iowa Vaccine Effectiveness Study, in which students were vaccinated with the second dose 13 years or more since the start of the outbreak. St seven studies were conducted in young adults, and the median vaccine effectiveness was 84%. There is increased risk for mumps and decreased vaccine effectiveness with time since the second dose of MMR. 
The risk for mumps complications is lower among cases vaccinated with two doses of MMR compared with unvaccinated. And most outbreaks occurred in residential or educational settings with high population density, spread to the broader community was limited. The work group interpretation of the evidence on two-dose vaccine effectiveness is that the two-dose program is acceptably effective at preventing mumps disease and complications in the general population, but not sufficiently effective at preventing mumps outbreaks in all close contact settings. However, protection against severe disease is maintained. Regarding the immune response to mumps virus, the summary of evidence, which is based on the limited laboratory data and compared to measles and rubella immune responses, shows lower antibody levels after mumps natural infection or vaccination, as well as lower quality of antibodies in terms of avidity and failure to generate a strong memory B cell response. Neutralizing antibodies are important for protection and persons with lower neutralization, neutralization titer had increased risk for disease. However, there is no defined immunologic correlate of protection. Mean mumps antibody titers, both neutralizing and non-neutralizing, decline over time in two-dose vaccine recipients. The work group's interpretation of the evidence is that the immune response to mumps virus is less robust compared with response to measles and rubella viruses, and that vaccine-induced mumps virus-specific antibodies wane over time, potentially leading to inadequate protection against mumps for populations in conditions of highest risk. And lastly, the work group reviewed the evidence on changes in the molecular epidemiology of wild-type mumps virus, which is summarized as vaccine contains genotype A virus. Since 2006, genotype G has been predominantly circulating in the U.S., though other genotypes were occasionally introduced by importation. There is no evidence to date that circulating mumps strains escape vaccine-induced immunity. To those vaccine recipients, all had neutralizing antibody against genetically diverse mumps strains when studied soon and 10 years after vaccination. However, studies found that to those vaccine recipients had lower about one half neutralizing antibody geometric mean titers to non-vaccine strains compared to the Jerry Lynn vaccine strain. The significance of this finding is difficult to interpret in the absence of a known level of neutralizing antibody that predicts protection. The work group concluded there is insufficient evidence to support that antigenic differences between vaccine and circulating mum strains are a major contributor to the current burden of mumps. In summary, for problem, the work group's interpretation is that persons at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak are a public health priority for the mumps vaccination program and that waning immunity from vaccination in the setting of increased force of infection typical of outbreaks contributes to this risk. Next, I will present the evidence for the second factor examined, benefits and harms of the intervention, which is the third dose of MMR vaccine. As a reminder, the work group identified prevention of mumps disease, prevention of complications of mumps disease, duration of protection, and immune response to the third dose as benefits, and serious adverse events and reactogenicity after the third dose as harms. Since the previous presentation described the evidence on benefits and harms, I will only briefly summarize it here. For prevention of mumps, three studies reported a lower attack rate in three-dose vaccine recipients versus two-dose vaccine recipients. Vaccine effectiveness ranged from 61% to 88% with one report 
being significant at 78%. A summary of the study that provides the strongest evidence to date on the benefit of the third dose of MMR for prevention of mumps is presented here. There was a lower attack rate for mumps in students vaccinated with three doses versus two, as seen in the graph. There was increased risk for mumps with increased time since the second dose, and receipt of the third dose was associated with a 78 lower risk for mumps than receipt of the second dose, with a 95% confidence interval of 61% to 88%. For prevention of mumps complications, no clinical studies were conducted. However, by preventing disease in MMR3 vaccinated persons, complications that would have occurred had these persons had disease are also prevented. For duration of protection, no clinical studies were available. And for immune response, studied sh studies showed an increase in the proportion of seropositive persons and antibody titers at one month post-MMR3 with a trend towards decline in both the proportion of seropositive persons and antibody titers by 12 months post-MMR3. For harms, the evidence reviewed showed there were no serious adverse events or vaccine-related healthcare visits in more than 14,000 three-dose vaccine recipients evaluated. And for reactogenicity, overall, local and systemic non-serious adverse events post-third dose were mild and reported at low rates. Among young adults, headache, joint pain, diarrhea, and swollen glands were reported at higher rates post-MMR3 compared with pre-MMR3 with a short duration. Median was one to three days. Based on this evidence, the work group interpreted the balance of benefits and harms as the benefits of the third dose of MMR vaccine outweigh the risks. Data demonstrated a short-term benefit of the third dose for persons in outbreak settings. There are no concerns for serious adverse events after the third dose of MMR. Injection site reactions and non-serious systemic adverse events were mild and reported at low rates. The evidence type is four for benefits and two for harms. Next, I will present the evidence on values, acceptability, and implementation from stakeholders' perspective. To provide evidence for the work group's assessment of these factors, we conducted surveys of identified stakeholders. We surveyed students and parents to learn more about their values and acceptability of a third dose and health department and universities and colleges to learn more about the acceptability and implementation of a third dose in an outbreak setting. Because these data have not been presented to ACIP, I will next present the main results from these surveys. Regarding students' and parents' opinion, CDC contacted several universities that experienced mumps outbreaks in 2016 and 2017 and only one of five agreed to participate. For the university that participated, the response rate was low, and therefore data are not presented. The university survey was distributed through the American College Health Association. 26% or 251 member student health service administrators responded. This included universities and colleges from 47 states. 31% of universities had mumps cases reported on campus since August 2014, of which 41% had a mumps outbreak. 22% of universities with mumps cases or outbreaks recommended an outbreak or third dose of MMR vaccine. From the university's experience, most respondents ranked student and parents' attitudes towards a third dose of MMR 
to protect the student during an outbreak as positive, more than five. On a scale from strongly negative to indifferent to strongly positive, 83% ranked students' attitudes towards the recommendation and 67% ranked students' attitudes towards attending a campaign as higher than five. 80% ranked parents' attitudes towards the recommendation as higher than five. The median ranking was between six and seven. Of note, very limited numbers were negative. Although no formal cost-benefit analysis was conducted, based on their experience using an outbreak or third dose of MMR vaccine, and compared with other outbreak control measures, on a scale from least to most, 60% of respondents felt the intervention was effective to some extent, better than neutral, and 53% regarded favorably the benefit of the intervention relative to its cost, both with a median of six. 75% were likely to recommend an outbreak or third dose again, 38% would recommend it without hesitation, with a median of eight overall. On a scale from not disruptive to extremely disruptive, almost all respondents indicated outbreaks resulted in some degree of disruption on campus, with half placing the intensity of disruption in the upper half of the scale, more than five. 57% of universities ranked disruption of mumps outbreaks to student life higher than five, while 67% ranked disruption to staff and administrative activities greater than five, both with a median of six. The health department survey was distributed through the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists to 62 state and territorial and 23 city or large urban health departments. 72% of health department jurisdictions responded. 75% or 46 reported having one or more mumps outbreaks since January 1st, 2016, of which 47% reported recommending an outbreak or third dose during at least one outbreak. Among health departments that used an outbreak or third dose, on a scale from not effective to most effective, 42% felt that the intervention had an effectiveness score higher than five, more than somewhat effective, with a median of five. 53% regarded favorably the benefit of the intervention relative to its cost, score higher than five, which is more than somewhat effective, with a median of seven. The workgroup's interpretation for values of target population is based on expert opinion. The workgroup considered that students and parents are concerned about mom's complications and the potential for loss of productivity, but not concerned with serious adverse events following the third dose of MMR. For acceptability, stakeholders who implemented an outbreak or third dose recommendation had a positive experience overall, including a positive assessment of students and parents' attitudes. For implementation, the work group agreed that an ACIP recommendation would allow health departments to make more rapid decisions regarding use of the third dose and increase access to the third dose for persons identified at increased risk because of an outbreak. The work group also considered that additional implementation guidance from CDC from the third dose will be needed. To address this need, CDC will update the guidance on use of a third dose of MMR vaccine during mumps outbreaks with input from the work group and other stakeholders. Among the factors to be considered in the development of the new guidance are size of the target population, mumps incidence or number of cases, third dose MMR vaccine coverage needed to impact an outbreak, timing of vaccination with a third dose, 
social networks and intensity and duration of close contact of the target population. CDC has several ongoing or planned priority activities to inform the development of this guidance and increase our understanding of the impact of a third dose of MMR vaccine. Develop transmission models to examine the factors that impact size and duration of an outbreak. Examine the contribution of antigenic differences between vaccine and circulating mumps strains on burden of mumps. Evaluate the quality of antibodies, namely avidity, after the third dose of MMR compared with after the second dose, and monitor the burden of disease over time among three-dose vaccine recipients to better characterize the duration of enhanced protection after the third dose of MMR. To conclude, to answer the policy question on whether a third dose of MMR vaccine should be administered to persons at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak, the work group's interpretation of the evidence reviewed is, for problem, persons at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak are a public health priority for the mumps vaccination program. Waning immunity in the setting of increased force of infection, typical of outbreaks, contributes to this risk. For benefits and harms, benefits outweigh the risks. The evidence type is four for effectiveness and two for safety. For values, the work group considered that persons in outbreak settings value prevention of mumps, of mumps complications, and of loss of productivity. For acceptability, the third dose MMR was considered acceptable to students, parents, universities, schools, and health departments. And for implementation, providers and the target population have experience with the third dose vaccination, and public health should be involved in identifying target groups at increased risk for mumps during an outbreak. In summary, there was work group agreement that a third dose of MMR vaccine would improve protection for persons at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak. Before I present the work group's proposed recommendation, I wanted to summarize the work group deliberations. There was unanimity among work group members that there is sufficient evidence to propose a recommendation to decrease risk for mumps disease in persons at increased risk because of an outbreak. The work group considered that public health should have a role in designating or identifying groups at increased risk for several reasons. Public health is routinely involved in declaring and responding to outbreaks and determining groups at increased risk. And this will be helpful for providers who are not directly associated with the outbreak setting. As far as the proposed recommendation wording, the majority of work group members favor the wording indicating that persons previously vaccinated with two doses of MMR vaccine who are identified by public health as at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak should receive a third dose of MMR vaccine to improve protection against mumps disease and related complications. A small minority, but more than one, preferred may instead of should in the wording may receive a third dose of MMR vaccine to improve protection against mumps disease and related complications. The main reasons expressed in support of may were Acknowledgement that there is a benefit, but the additional benefit is modest and disease is generally mild. The grading of evidence is low and evidence comes largely from one study. And a May recommendation would not obligate immunization campaigns by organizations and public health in response to each outbreak. The main reasons expressed in support of should were Evidence demonstrate a benefit of MMR3 for individuals. A single well-conducted vaccine effectiveness study during an outbreak on a college campus is sufficient. It's unlikely the evidence type will improve 
as biases are difficult to control in observational studies, particularly work conducting during outbreaks. A should recommendation is clear, much easier to communicate and promote, and is preferred by providers. And lastly, looking at the implications of the proposed recommendation in the context of the existing recommendations for mumps vaccination, the impact will be only for persons previously vaccinated with two doses of MMR vaccine who are in an outbreak setting. All other combinations of vaccination status are covered by the existing recommendation. There will be no recommendation at this time for persons who have already received three or more doses of MMR vaccine. Um, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of work group members and again my colleagues from the CDC MAMS team. And um, I have next the proposed recommendation. So how should we proceed? So the proposed recommendation for the policy question, should a third dose of MMR vaccine be administered to persons at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak? The work group proposes persons previously vaccinated with two doses of a mumps containing vaccine who are identified by public health as at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak should receive a third dose of a mumps containing vaccine to improve protection against mumps disease and related complications. You, you notice the, a, a small change in wording. We're using mumps containing vaccines. Vaccine, it um, um, would, would cover MMR and MMRV. That's why it's mumps containing and it's consistent with the existing recommendation, wording in the 2013 recommendation for use of MMR vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Marin. That was an excellent summary. Um, and we're very appreciative of you using the new framework. It works very well. Um, questions and discussion. Dr. Belanja. Thank you. Excellent presentation. So um, are you um, uh, at all um, uh, you know, sort of OK, I'm blanking on my, my question now. I'll take a different one. I'll come back to that. I had two in mind, and I forgot them both. <laughs> <laughs> what was your name again? <laughs> that mid-afternoon thing. <laughs> Would anyone else like to go? Yes, Dr. Hetmar. So um, the question that I have relates to the timing from MMR2 to the MMR3 and whether that's going to be captured in the uh, identified by public health as at increased risk um, because this doesn't really give any guidance for the individual who got MMR2 a month ago, six months ago, or a year ago. And the data that was presented in June really showed that the majority of people, at least in the Iowa outbreak, um, it had been a number of years since they'd gotten MMR2. And, and so how is that, is that, that's not, or I, I'm interested in understanding how the work group thought that should be factored into the, the guidance that goes out, whether it's in the recommendation or the accompanying information? I think that was considered to be part of a CDC guidance. Um, I know that uh, public health people in our work group are not so much in favor of checking every single record and determining time since vaccination. Um, and uh, I think it was um, left for a CDC guidance. It was persons who before the outbreak would have two doses then uh, outbreaks are occurring into those vaccinated. Is there any intervention for them that would improve their protection? Can I just say answer yes, yes. <laughs> we will commit that in the clinical guidance, of course we will provide guidance into how to think about time since last vaccination, yes. Thank you. Dr. Valanja. Thank you. I remembered my question now. Um, so it, it's regarding the health department survey. I was kind of struck by the fact that there was a, a lot less enthusiasm than I would have predicted for MMR3. Do you have any insights into that? 
Um, no, we noticed that it was much, uh, there was more vari variability on the scale. Um, I think um, health departments um, dealt with situations. It's hard to mount a campaign uh, while responding to an outbreak, finding resources. Um, probably Kelly can uh, um, provide more insights. Well, just as sort of a, a follow-up to that regarding the, the may versus should, was there any concern in the work group that by making it a should that it might be a disincentive to declare an outbreak if a, if a health department is sort of strapped for resources? Um, no, but we... I think that I can help um, with that. I think one of the things that, um, you know, for other uh, vaccines such as meningococcal vaccine and Tdap, we do have you should get vaccinated in the setting of an outbreak, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a health department has to mount a campaign. They could send letters home. They could just increase awareness. So there's various different approaches. And I think it may be, and this is speculation, that without a recommendation, it actually did require more focus and resources and an intensity than it may with a recommendation. Dr. Duchin, would you like to comment? Thank you, and my neighbor would as well. Um, my, I guess my comment is um, these campaigns, if they are mounted, um, are very resource intensive. They're a heavy lift. And for a large university, um, it's an extremely big undertaking. So I think this is um, a, a recommendation that will be will have a lot of implications in practice if it goes should rather than may. Um, on the other hand, if you do go forward, um, it would be very useful, I think, to be very clear about whether this recommendation is being made for outbreak control or to reduce um, clinical manifestations in the individual student. Uh, it has very um, different implications for who does the vaccinating. I just, again, because we at CDC have the opportunity to compare across. So the language in this is very similar to the language of other outbreak response vaccines. And while I understand the issue, we could point you to multiple similar languages across other outbreak vaccines in which the languages should and the universities and health departments implementation of that widely vary. So I'm not telling you what to do here, but I just want to say that we, we can say from a long experience that we don't feel like this language locks in a health department or a university um, in terms of what they have to do in terms of mounting a campaign versus educating. And the issue about whether they're um, trying to stop an outbreak versus individual protection, I think, is a subtlety that the working group was trying to get to with this language, if I understood. Can I just follow up on that? I mean, is the level of evidence for the other um, recommendations comparable to this? Can you call, comment on that? I mean, I can comment on the meningococcal um, uh, evidence. It's, I, I, it's very similar, actually. It protects individuals. Whether or not vaccination campaigns can reduce the size or scope of an outbreak is highly variable on the timing of when you implement, the, how quickly you can get coverage up. There's so many programmatic issues around that that actually having and gaining enough evidence to show that this, um, that, you know, it should, um, especially um, since it's a since there's strong transition, but it's to, to get the evidence is going to be challenging. Dr. Moore. Thank you. Yes, I can say from the from the work group standpoint, our our focus was on individual protection where there is evidence. And and in fact, I think one of the, coming from a state that has dealt with outbreaks, I can say one of the strains and stresses is that these states were left kind of on their own to figure out what they wanted to do, and different ones chose different degrees of heavy lifting, you know, as was evident from the responses of the states. And so by giving clear guidance and then with CDC and another support to explain, given the mildness of disease, this may not be where you mount a huge campaign, but instead you say for students or, or affected persons who, you know, they should get this vaccine because it will reduce their risk of mumps. Um, believe it or not, there's not a 100% acceptance of all of our recommendations. People don't necessarily beat the doors down to get their vaccines even when we tell them they should. Um, but this will make it much clearer and more straightforward for respondents. And as the other thing that's um, evident is the heterogeneity of the outbreaks. You know, 13% of the outbreaks were a huge proportion of the actual cases. Most of the outbreaks were actually quite small and may not be appropriate for a vaccination uh, 
outreach effort. And that's why there was so much involved with outbreak management that we felt it was not an area we wanted to get into. So we just stuck with the individual protection where we felt we were on solid ground. Thank you. Dr. Plotkin. So I promise this is my last disruptive comment of the day. But uh, I think the recommendation is illogical in this sense. No one doubts that immunity wanes. This is, uh, as, as was said, this has been shown uh, definitely that B-cell memory wanes. Okay, so that means that, uh, that every one with two doses is at risk of having lost uh, immunity. Second point is that, as was said, that this is a phenomenon that operates in, uh, in uh, closed or, or communities where there's close contact, universities. Third point is, according to the data that were given, if I calculated correctly, something like 12% of universities report that they've had a problem. So to me, the logical thing is to recommend a third dose of MMR for, uh, in, for um, boys and girls entering colleges. I mean, that's straightforward, and it prevents, which is what we're all here for, to prevent disease, not to respond to outbreaks once they've started. Thank you. Uh, I think Dr. Szilagyi, you were up. You're done, okay. Dr. Schaffner. Uh, Dr. Duchin mentioned my, my, my interest. I was uh, curious also that the rationale to improve protection against mumps disease and related complications appeared to be entirely clinical and seemed to ignore its contribution to the curtailment of an outbreak. Susan Even, thank you. Uh, College Health. Turned it back off. One comment, um, as a member of the work group, but also as a um, host to university for a mumps outbreak, um, had the guidelines been, and we've been having some clear guidance, and I think the guidance from CDC is what's going to be helpful for our health department, we might not ha have had as widespread as many because it started in a smaller subset. So some of the, like some of them in other universities as well, but in smaller subsets like a, an a athletic team or a particular um, Greek organization as opposed to an immunization amount that would need to be for the entire institution. So addressing it early um, for those who are at the highest risk might still not involve a huge number of immunizations, but it would make it um, um, a clear cut and a prompt response. Thank you. Dr. Lee? Okay. No. <laughs> well, apparently you had your hand up at some point. <laughs> Raise my hand. <laughs> um, well, I just, I, I actually like the really disruptive comment uh, by Dr. Plotkin. I, I think it's um, uh, something to consider, but I would just say that now that we have started to pilot this framework, I think it is helpful if, if that were the question, which it's not in this framework right now, um, to actually complete a cost effectiveness analysis for that particular um, part of it before making a decision on that. Um, I do think that uh, it's interesting because it, uh, the way it's described, it seems like it's both for individual protection and outbreak control. Um, so I guess to Dr. Duchin's point, it's, in, it's an interesting question about who is responsible in that situation. And I guess this gives the flexibility, which may or may not be wanted, <laughs> but it gives the flexibility so that in, in an implementation situation, it can really be sort of a, a partnership and at the discretion of that partnership to decide how to, how to run it. Dr. Maldonado. Thank you. Um, uh, we, uh, the Red Book Committee uh, has uh, reviewed this issue and we spoke about it before the meeting. Um, we actually really, at, for a first step, given how, what we don't know about, for example, T cell immunity or reasons for this current uh, increase in cases, for the time being, we actually thought this would be a reasonable way to approach um, vaccination for providers and to give them guidance um, in dealing with 
um, the flexible nature or the unpredictable nature of what may happen. We don't know where this outbreak, the situations may head in the future and whether or not, as Dr. Potkin mentioned, I think it is, and as Grace mentioned, it may be reasonable in the future to think about a third dose, but I don't know that we're there yet. And this is a really good compromise for the general provider who will be facing, uh, you know, questions from college-bound families of college-bound uh, kids. Um, and universities on their own may decide that they want to institute a third dose on their own, but that's really up to them. I think this gives people a lot of leeway to be able to at least address the individual risk. And, Thank you. And the committee feels the way as well. Thank you. Dr. Atmar. And just go, to go back to the EPI data that were presented, only half the outbreaks and 40% of the cases were in university uh, students. So, but I mean, I think it is a question worth taking back to the work group to consider the question or, or the uh, policy that uh, Dr. Plotkin suggested. Dr. Moore. Thank you. One thing that we did discuss this question, but given that as the evidence uh, discussion went through, we have no data on duration of protection at all and without, in the absence of any of that duration evidence and with no immunologic correlative protection that we can use to then uh, extrapolate what that protection would be, we did not feel that we had any evidence to support a decision about a routine dose outside of it, an actual exposure situation where there was an, an, an immediate need for that vaccine because if they got vaccinated as an incoming freshman, the majority of them would not be on a campus with an outbreak or maybe they're a senior and by that point do they need a, another dose or will that dose work as well? The, all those unanswered questions left us unable to address that particular question at this time. Thank you. Dr. Savoy. So the one question that I wasn't sure about, if you're their practicing provider, so it makes a lot of sense to me if you're on the university and so the public health people show up and they say, there's an outbreak here, and then everybody knows that they're supposed to get the vaccine. But if I'm Margot Savoy sitting in my office, um, I may or may not get an email from the public health department that tells me that there's an outbreak down the street. So I'm not sure that I would ever end up giving the vaccine because I wouldn't know that it's been identified by a public health as an increased risk. And so the way that it's currently written, while I understand why it would be helpful in some instances, I can also understand why it would be rate limiting because if somebody just showed up to me and said, hey, without a letter or something else that verified, hey, I'm at this increased risk because supposedly I was exposed, I don't know that I would be able to lean on this to explain how I would be giving them that vaccine. And so if your intent is for Joe Schmo and the public to be able to figure out what they're supposed to do, I'm not 100% sure that this covers you the way that it's written, or I would have assumed it or read it that way, the way that you have it currently drafted. Dr. Moore. Thanks for that comment. One of the, the role of public health in these outbreaks is to communicate the message out to clinicians, not just to the university setting, but you know we have other community outbreaks that go on. We have met methods of reaching clinicians in our communities for any kind of public health concern through health alerts and other things, and those are the mechanisms that can be used to, to get the word out, just as we do with any other community outbreak of any kind. So we would employ those methods to get the word to the clinical community, but we felt that it was particularly important for clinicians not to be stuck on their own without guidance, trying to figure out if a child needed an, an additional dose of vaccine uh, because of the variation, the heterogeneity of these outbreaks. Dr. Hunter. Comment? Dr. Lee, <laughs> which is just that uh, I, I think that's the distinction intuitive. that um, uh, we want all the clarity in this one sentence, but I guess I would just advocate that we are focused on where the evidence base is for the recommendation and then use the guidance to help with implementation. Dr. Romero. So uh, not to cut the discussion short, but I'd like to call the motion. No more questions? Make like the motion. To, so um, I'd like to motion that we vote on the um, question, which is persons previously vaccinated with two vac doses of a mumps containing vaccine as signified below, who are identified by public health as at increased risk for mumps because of an outbreak should receive a third dose of a mumps containing vaccine to improve protection against mumps disease and related questions. Complication, sorry. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. 
Uh, Dr. Valanja will be the second. <laughs> we have to name someone. So. Okay, any further discussion or should we move to a vote? Dr. Reingold. Um, I would just like to commend the work group on the alacrity with which they collected these data and brought them to us. Agreed. Is there any public comment on this issue before we move to a vote? We have none registered, but okay, I guess not. So I think we'll move to a vote. Could we start with you, Ms. Pellegrini? Pellegrini, yes. Atmar, yes. Lee, yes. Balanja, yes. Moore, yes. Salaji, yes. Walter, yes. Riley, yes. Stevens, yes. Bennett, yes. Romero, yes. Ryan Gold, yes. Camp, yes. Hunter, yes. Ezanolo, yes. So I believe that the motion passes. Um, thank you very much. Thanks so much to the Monks Work Group. This was excellent work, and thank you to you all. We're going to move right into vaccine safety, and Dr. Kroger will introduce this session. No, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. We're going to do VFC, and I apologize. I think Dr. Santoli is going to kill me before long. <laughs> Um, hello there. Uh, this next very brief presentation is the VFC resolution um, that will um, mirror um, what you've just discussed. So this is to update the MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella vaccines VFC resolution. Okay. Can I ask people in the back to take their conversations outside? We're having a little bit of trouble hearing Dr. Santoli. So the purpose of this resolution is to both add um, guidance about the use of mumps-containing vaccines in the context of an outbreak, but also to update the links um, in, the, in this uh, resolution. It's been about eight years since it's been updated, so we have updated links to your recommendations as well. So the first component is the MMR component of the resolution. The eligible group section where the text is all in white is completely unchanged. Um, the recommended schedule for measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines, the yellow font here indicates a change, and that is that the link has been updated to reflect the 2013 ACIP recommendation. In addition, there's been language added about persons previously vaccinated with two doses. I'm not going to go over this language because you've just reviewed it, but I will say that there was an inadvertent uh, difference from what Dr. Marin presented at the end, it says it's complications instead of related complications, and that will be changed before this is um, published, if that's what the vote is. That was an unintentional distinction. The dosage intervals for measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines link has also been updated, again, to reflect the 2013 ACIP recommendation. The recommended dosage section has been updated just to refer to product package inserts, and the contraindications and precautions section has been updated also to reflect the 2013 ACIP recommendation. There are no changes to the varicella component of the resolution. For the MMRV component of the resolution, the eligible group section is unchanged. The link in the recommended schedule for combined measles, mumps, Rubella and varicella vaccine section has been updated to reflect the 2010 ACIP recommendations. Additional language in that section has also been updated so that it mirrors the language in the 2010 ACIP recommendations. I'll give you a minute to look at this because you haven't discussed it. Again, what's in yellow has been slightly reworded to be more true to the 2010 ACIP recommendations. Going to move to the next. 
The dosage intervals for combined measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella vaccines section has also been updated to reflect the 2010 link. The dosage section has been updated similar to refer to product package inserts, and the contraindications and precautions sections um, have also been updated to reflect the 2010 ACIP recommendations. And then lastly, this is just a statement indicating that the next publication within the next 12 months would be incorporated into this VFC resolution by reference. That concludes the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Santoli. Is there a motion to uh, move the VFC? Ms. Pellegrini? Is there? I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution as it appeared here. Second. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none, I think we'll vote. And could we start with Dr. Lee? Lee, yes. Balanja, yes. Moore, yes. Salaji, yes. Walter, yes. Riley, yes. Stevens, yes. Bennett, yes. Romero, yes. Ryan Gold, yes. Camp, yes. Hunter, yes. Ezanolo, yes. Pellegrini, yes. Atmar, yes. So that is unanimously passed. Um, I hope you all appreciate that in former days, your, your chair used to tell you to go clockwise or counterclockwise, and it was always very confusing. So now I've been leaving it up to you, <laughs> which is probably more confusing. <laughs> thank you all very much, and thank you, Dr. Santoli. And now, Dr. Kroger. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so on September 19th, the CDC launched a campaign which is ongoing to promote safe intramuscular vaccination in adults. Um, one of the goals of this campaign is to prevent shoulder injury after vaccination. Uh, in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes to a half hour, um, you will hear uh, about the impetus behind this campaign. Um, uh, first, we'll have uh, Dr. Narayan Nair from the Health Resources Service Administration, who will present National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program claims data pertaining to shoulder injury. Then uh, Dr. Tom Shimabukuro from CDC's Immunization Safety Office will discuss his office's review of data on reports of adverse events related to the shoulder uh, uh, from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS. Uh, and then I'm going to conclude with a discussion of the uh, campaign and CDC resources. In the interest of time, I think we'd like to do, if possible, the three presentations and then take questions at the end. And so without further ado, I will uh, cede the mic to Dr. Narayan Nair. So uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Norai Nair. I'm the uh, Division Director and Chief Medical Officer for the Division of Injury Compensation Programs um, in HRSA, and we administer the National Vaccine in uh, Injury Compensation Program. So I'll provide some background on shoulder injury related to vaccine administration, or CERVA, and then I'll share with you some compensation data from our program. So shoulder injury related to vaccine administration is thought to result from the unintentional injection of the vaccine into the tissues and structures uh, that lie underneath the deltoid muscle of the shoulder. Uh, the Institute of Medicine reviewed the scientific and medical literature and found that the evidence convincingly supported a causal relationship between vaccine administration and what they referred to as deltoid bursitis. Um, one of the pieces of evidence that they considered was a paper uh, by Dr. Tenisoff et al. Uh, she's a, a medical team leader with our program, and she published a case series reporting on the experience of the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program with regard to shoulder injuries following vaccination. The IOM uh, reviewed this article and recommended that the cases were consistent with deltoid bursitis. And just to give you a little background, this was a small case series uh, of 13 claims, all of whom were adults. 
Um, they all had shoulder pain. 93% uh, reported that the pain started within 24 hours after vaccination. Over half said that they had significant pain immediately after vaccination. Um, and nearly half of them um, had concerns at the time of administration that the vaccine was given too high in the shoulder compared to previous vaccinations. The most common findings in this case series uh, were pain and limited range of motion. Um, there, it was very uncommon for them to report any type of neurologic uh, symptoms. 31% um, of uh, these individuals required some type of surgical intervention, uh, and over half of them uh, required a corticosteroid injection for their shoulder pain. And just to review uh, the shoulder anatomy, uh, this is an anterior view of the right shoulder, and you can see the uh, chromium uh, and the deltoid muscle, and underneath that, underlying that, uh, is the subacromial bursal space. Um, and and there are uh, other additional reports of uh, shoulder injuries related to vaccine administration. Most notably, there was a paper by Boder that was published in Vaccine in 2006, um, and that reported on two cases of shoulder pain after vaccination uh, that occurred within two days of vaccination. Um, they used ultrasound on both patients and on 21 controls, and what they found is that that bursa uh, can extend uh, three to six centimeters beyond the acromion. Um, and that it can lie anywhere between 0.8 centimeters uh, to 1.6 centimeters uh, below the surface of the skin. Um, and so that's roughly about uh, a third to a 0.6 of an inch. Uh, given that a standard adult needle is an inch, um, they proposed a theory that the vaccine uh, was given high in the shoulder and the contents of the vaccine uh, were injected into the subacromial bursal space, which triggered a robust local inflammatory response uh, that led to bursitis, tendonitis, and inflammation of the shoulder capsule. Um, in this paper, the authors proposed um, that injection should not be performed in the upper third of the deltoid muscle and to avoid these types of injuries. And I, I wanted to share with you some of our, our compensation uh, data, um, uh, and we operate on the fiscal year. Um, and so Dr. Tenisoff's paper was published in 2010. The Institute of Medicine um, uh, published its findings in 2011. Uh, and you can see from fiscal year 2011 to 2014, we had 59 claims alleging uh, shoulder injury, and those individuals uh, received $9.7 million approximately. In 2015, that number had increased uh, for that year alone to up to 98 cases. Uh, and uh, $12.4 million. Uh, in 2016, uh, we had 202 claims alleging CERVA, uh, and compensation was $29 million. And this last fiscal year, 2017, we had 163 claims, and the compensation was $19.9 million. Um, I do want to mention this doesn't, uh, we do pay attorney's fees, uh, whether a claim is, is compensated or not. Uh, this does not in include attorney's fees and legal cost. Um, the um, Serva was added to the vaccine injury table earlier this year, um, and uh, we do compensate uh, many injuries that aren't found on the vaccine injury table, uh, but the benefit of being on the table does streamline the process. It also allows for a look-back period where individuals have a, a longer period of time to file, uh, in this case, a Serva claim. Uh, so we expect to see uh, significant numbers of claims in, in the future as well. And uh, that concludes my portion, and I understand we'll take questions at the end. So I'll turn it over to Tom. Mm -hmm. I'll be presenting reports of shoulder dysfunction following an activated influenza vaccine in the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. So this is an anterior view of the right shoulder, and I've highlighted the deltoid muscle there. So imagine that those arrows are injection sites, and you're tracking up the arm um, away from the thickest, most centrally located portion of the deltoid muscle where you want to give the shot. And you can see how as you move up the arm, uh, you potentially increase the opportunity to inject into structures like the bursa or the rotator cuff tendons, which is where you don't want to inject because you can cause a shoulder injury. I'm not going to cover the. I'm not going to cover again the background that Dr. Nair covered. But just to remind you, in February 2017, 
shoulder injury related to vaccine administration, or CERVA, was added to the injury table. And by definition, CERVA is caused by an injury to the musculoskeletal structures of the shoulder. Shoulder CERVA is not a neurologic injury. So you've seen the background, and you've seen the claims data, but really the, the, the question remains, is there an epidemic of shoulder injuries related to vaccine administration? And then how would you address that question? So our objective was to describe reports submitted to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System of shoulder dysfunction following an activated influenza vaccine. Just to remind you, VAERS is our spontaneous reporting system. It's subject to the limitations of spontaneous reporting. Most importantly, generally, we cannot assess causality from VAERS data alone. You'll notice that our outcome is called shoulder dysfunction following immunization. That implies a temporally associated adverse event. In contrast to shoulder injury related to vaccine administration, which assumes or implies a causal association. So our definition included shoulder pain and restricted range of motion following injection of IV into the upper arm. The affected shoulder must be of the same arm in which IV was administered alone. We exclude reports where more than one vaccination was given in the arm with the affected shoulder. Onset was within 48 hours. And we exclude reports of neurologic injuries like brachial neuritis, which is a separate table injury. Lastly, symptoms had to last longer than one week to differentiate from injection site reactions. This is a, a key difference between the definition we used and the de definition for CERVA um, as it relates to injury compensation. Generally, for CERVA, you have to have symptoms lasting longer than six months. Because of the way reports are submitted to VAERS and because of some of the limitations of VAERS and follow-up, that's, that's really not possible. So we made a decision that if a patient was having symptoms for longer than one week, that was likely to be something other than a, a simple injection site reaction. We use measure terms that potentially describe shoulder dysfunction and selected vaccine administration error terms and a text string search for arm or shoulder. All reports identified in the initial search were classified into not a case, indeterminate case, or possible case. For reference, here's some of the MEDRA terms we used, and page two of the MEDRA terms. So 2,198 VAERS reports met the initial search criteria, and of these, 1,006, 46%, were classified as a possible case, and these were included in our analysis. This shows reports by influenza season for the analytic period. And just using the eyeball test, you might, be, you might convince yourself that there's been a slight increase in the number of reports as we move through the analytic period. However, if you look at shoulder dysfunction reports as a percent of all IV reports, it's pretty constant at around 2% of all reports. So I'm gonna now do a couple side-by-side -side comparisons of shoulder dysfunction following IIV reports compared to non-shoulder dysfunction reports and point out some differences. The first difference is, is sex. See that 82% of the shoulder dysfunction reports were in females compared to 69% of non-shoulder dysfunction reports. Less than 1% were in the zero to 18 year age group compared to 17% for non-shoulder dysfunction reports. Most of the reports were in the 19 to 59 year old age group. And lastly, 52% of the reports came from patients compared to 22% of reports for the non-shoulder dysfunction reports. That's a pretty substantial difference. Um, and that's different than VAERS reports in general, where about 15 to 20% of reports come from patients or parents. So the, the onset interval, the onset had to occur within 48 hours by definition. 
However, in, in 75% of these reports, symptoms occurred on the day of vaccination. In 85% of reports, the pain had not resolved at the time the report was made to VAERS. In 49% of reports, the patient was seen by a healthcare provider for shoulder dysfunction. Referral to a specialist was not commonly documented in the reports, but when it was, um, the patients were most uh, commonly referred to an orthopedist. So this is a, a table of commonly reported shoulder dysfunction related adverse events. These are not mutually exclusive, so these numbers add up to more than 1,006. What you see here is on the top, the most common adverse events are these broad, um, relatively non-specific specific events like shoulder pain, injected limb mobility decreased, and joint range of motion decreased. Less commonly reported are these more specific events like bursitis, rotator cuff syndrome, or frozen shoulder. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over ADLs, but we can come back to those if you have questions. So in 222 of the 106 reports, uh, there was documentation of a contributing factor described in the narrative. And of these, uh, of these, most commonly described was vaccination given too high on the arm. Improper or poor administration technique is kind of a grab bag of, 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 um, uh, of descriptions of, of basically improper or poor administration technique, but variable. And then uneven position between the vaccinator and the patient is usually the vaccinator standing above the patient while the patient is sitting down. So these are the total number of shoulder dysfunction reports during the analytic period broken down by place of vaccination. If you focus on the top here, you see that in 40% of the reports, the vaccination was given in a pharmacy or a drugstore, and in 32% of reports, it was a doctor's office or hospital. Those two account for 72% of all shoulder dysfunction reports, and then 12% were in the workplace. So in summary, reports to VAERS of shoulder dysfunction following IIV range from 128 to 223 during the six influenza seasons we looked at. During that period, around 130 million doses of IIV were distributed each flu season. There was a higher percentage of reports of shoulder dysfunction following IIV among females when compared to non-shoulder dysfunction reports. Most reports were in the age group 19 to 59 years, fewer in individuals 0 to 18 years. When possible contributing factors were described, vaccination given too high on the arm was most commonly reported. And the most common place of vaccination documented in reports was pharmacies or drugstores and doctor's offices or hospitals. So in conclusion, improperly placed IV or any injectable vaccine has the potential to cause a shoulder injury. However, reports to VAERS of shoulder dysfunction following IV appear rare given the amount of IV distributed in the US each flu season. There does not appear to be an increase in shoulder dysfunction reports following IV submitted to VAERS during recent flu seasons. And finally, proper administration technique is important, and Dr. Kroger will discuss that topic in his presentation now. Thank you. Okay, so I'll uh, uh, share some highlights of the, uh, the CDC NCIRD campaign um, and then provide uh, some information about resources that are available um, for uh, um, uh, safe intramuscular uh, vaccination in adults. Um, So, uh, as just mentioned, uh, there was a, a, a substantial percentage of the adult VAERS reports came from either uh, pharmacies or stores. So, um, really, before anything was um, uh, uh, rolled out on, on web pages and the like, we did have a couple phone calls. Uh, we had phone calls with the um, American Pharmacists Association, as well as um, the National Association of uh, Chain Drug Stores and the National Community Pharmacists Association. 
Association. Um, we had a phone call with awardees, uh, basically to uh, uh, with all of these groups to to share uh, what was coming uh, with our with our website rollout. Um, we also uh, updated our. Um, vaccine administration uh, web page, posted an online tool for vaccine administration. Uh, we call that an e-learn. Um, uh, this is basically an online uh, tool for vaccine administration. Uh, training tool that includes embedded videos. And in this case, the videos highlight correct administration techniques. So I'll show you those tools in just a moment. Um, uh, they were basically the product of uh, over a year of work. And we actually did do some promotion of these tools in advance of the official uh, start of the campaign. For instance, on September 13th, uh, the Current Issues and Immunization Net Conference webinar on influenza shared some information about shoulder injury. Um, and highlighted the e-learn. Uh, we uh, also released, uh, as the part of the campaign initiation, we released an infographic as well as a newsletter article uh, template, which did appear in several, uh, in, sorry, in September uh, pharmacist journals. Um, but I, would, I do want to highlight our infographic, and I shared this uh, as a hard copy with the liaisons uh, and the ACIP members, um, uh, placed it on the table at the noon hour. I don't know if people had a chance to look at it, but because it's kind of a small image on our template. Um, but the important thing is the URL at the top. This is where the infographic is located. And this essentially highlights our, our uh, campaign message. Uh, the campaign is taglined, know the site, get it right. Um, and uh, appropriately uh, promotes current educational tools as well as um, the outcome we are trying to prevent. So basically the first row highlights the importance of selecting the correct needle length. This of course is critical to ensuring that immunizations are delivered by the correct intramuscular route. Um, as many know, in addition to needle length, um, uh, the selection of which is, of course, based on age, gender, and the site selection, proper intramuscular placement of vaccine is based on technique. Um, so uh, in the second row, we, we focus on correct site selection, uh, which we believe to be really the essence of correcting these administration errors. Uh, the uh, correct site, that is the deltoid muscle, uh, uh, visualized by that it's kind of small on the slide, but an inverted equilateral triangle, the base of which is located uh, some distance from the acromion process. Now, for adults, we think two inches is an appropriate distance. We acknowledge that in children, it may be more useful to measure this in terms of finger breaths. Um, but the key point is you've got the picture on this infographic, uh, inject into the uh, center of this triangle for appropriate deltoid uh, administration. And then the third row highlights some aspects of proper technique, such as the injection angle of 90 degrees. And also uh, the row highlights uh, attention to other aspects of safe injection practices. In the lower right-hand corner is a link to our uh, recently revised vaccine administration webpage. Um, I think I went backwards there. Uh, actually, no, I didn't. Okay, so here, uh, before I get to the web page, let me talk a bit about our newsletter article template. So our focus on this was to highlight that shoulder injuries are preventable with correct IM administration. And the, uh, the article also highlights these resources, the vaccine administration e-learn, which we posted on June 21st, 2017, and our revised vaccine ad administration webpage, which was posted September 1st, 2017. Um, and then all throughout, we uh, identify uh, the specific shoulder injuries we're talking about, shoulder bursitis primarily, um, although there were a couple, uh, uh, there was a case report of tendonitis as well. Uh, this is our revised vaccine administration webpage. Um, it is a direct link from our immunization provider webpage. And this is a 
sample page from our Vaccine Administration eLearn. Now what this is, is it's a self-paced education tool uh, with links to videos and resources. It contains knowledge checks is and is available for continuing education credit. And this one, of course, is uh, focused on uh, vaccine administration, but has information on uh, shoulder injury related to vaccine administration as well. Since the campaign began, we've had 3,411 clicks to the CDC website, uh, 3,108 coming directly from the emails we sent. Another uh, 303 were most likely clicks from other e uh, emails in which our links were pasted. Uh, 3,204 of these clicks came from the United States. Uh, our I am administration videos, which are on our education page, our, admi our administration page, and as part of our eLearn also exists on a YouTube page, uh, which was, uh, uh, and our product was accessed via 1,235 clicks from this location. Um, our vaccine administration page has a resources subpage, which has received 762 clicks. These data come from the uh, first three weeks uh, into the campaign. In essence, our, ca our campaign uh, thus far, uh, I do want to acknowledge the above individuals and uh, open the uh, mic up for discussion and any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Kroger. Questions? Dr. Salaji. Yeah, just very quickly, um, very interesting presentation. Two, two quick uh, questions, one or a comment. There were almost no children in this, and children do have bursa, they do get bursitis. So I, just, just a comment and you know, a question about why that might be. And the second is, what percentage of all IIV is given in pharmacies in adults? I'm just trying to figure out what the increased likelihood is. Is it something like 20% in can pharmacies? You pull my, can you pull my presentation up again? The, the question about um, children, I guess up to a certain age, children get vaccine in the quadriceps, so they're, they're not at risk. Um, I, I mean, that's a good question. I guess we can, we can look at, I mean, we can look at maybe other vaccines that are given uh, in, in, in children and adolescents in addition to influenza vaccine to maybe get some additional data on that. Um, those three that were in, those three that were under the age of 18 you saw on the table, they were in older children, I think 13, 14, and 17, but, but older, older children. Uh, can you go to the last, if you could go to the, the last slide on my presentation, or one of the seconds of the last slide. One, keep it going. Yeah, this one. So this, um, th this is, is from a survey, the National Internet Flu Survey, um, for the season 2015, 2016, which doesn't go through the whole season. I think it stops in November. So this is where vaccines are, are, are given, uh, the, the green line. And then the VAERS uh, shoulder dysfunction reports for the 2015, 2016 season. It's not the whole data set I presented just for that season are shown there. So you can, you can see a bit of a, a, a mismatch there between reports and place of vaccination, but it looks like from here that maybe 25 or so percent of uh, flu vaccine, at least in that season through through November, was given in pharmacies, and that's consistent with other data that I've heard that around a quarter of vaccines are given in pharmacies and drugstores. So that begs the question: Are you targeting pharmacies for this information campaign and education campaign? Let me say that the the VAERS data are passive; uh, they're passively reported, and there are plenty of reporting biases in VAERS data. So we're not making any assumptions on place of vaccination. We're just presenting the data as far as targeting. I'll let Dr. Kroger answer that. I mean, the focus of the campaign is adults, but we're targeting all providers that uh, provide vaccines to adults. So obviously there have been discussions with pharmacist groups because of this, but it's really kind of an adult uh, intramuscular administration campaign. Dr. Walter. 
Yes, Tom, you looked at flu vaccine. Did you look at other antigens as well to see if reporting was comparable with other antigens? We haven't yet. Uh, the, initial, the initial review we did, um, we, we knew that most of the Serva claims in VICP were for influenza vaccine, so we wanted to start out lo looking at that information. We also wanted to keep this clean. So one, one vaccine given in, in the shoulder, um, there, there were some potential issues with um, tetanus-containing vaccines being um, more reactogenic and, and, and painful with the pain lasting longer, and maybe people are getting tetanus vaccines for other reasons. But certainly, uh, I think we can expand this to look at other vaccines as well. Dr. Massonier, a uh, question for Tom. Um, can you um, very shortly mention um, our first ever FEA DeHersa? So, look at that data. so uh, CDC, our, our office, the Immunization Safety, safety Office, um, will be uh, conducting an, an epi aid investigation with our EIS officer. We'll be going to HRSA to uh, assist them in reviewing some of these cases for scientific purposes, not for the purpose of adjudicating claims, for scientific purposes, um, to help them with their review and their publication of the of the review of, 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 of claims submitted to the injury compensation program. Other questions? Dr. Lee. Just really quickly, it might be um, really helpful to uh, dive down a little bit deeper into the pharmacy and whether or not it's retail-based clinics and nurse practitioners, for example, or if it's pharmacists, in part because it seems like it would be really great to partner with those national organizations to uh, sort of develop toolkits as you're doing and training and competencies and to support this. And much like everything else in the world, like the higher the volume, the better we are at things, whether it's a procedure or immunizations. So it may be that in the um, physician's office, where in pediatri pediatrician's offices where the volume is just huge, that competency is there. Whereas in a pharmacy that may or may not see a lot of um, children, for example, it's they're less comfortable with it. So CDC has been working with the American Pharmacists Association and the um, National Association of Chain Drug Stores in order to get the words out through their constituencies. And they do have uh, immunization curricula for their vaccinators in store. Um, but yes, in terms of being able to tell whether it's a, a clinic within a pharmacy or a pharmacist, we don't have right now that level of data. Okay, further questions? Thank you very much. And now we'll move on to an update on HPV vaccine. Dr. Markowitz, Dr. Salaji to start. Thanks for hanging in there. This will only take three hours. Our last HPV vaccine session uh, was, exact, was a year ago, October 2016, although every session during 2016 there were presentations about HPV, particularly the two-dose um, two schedule. And in October 2016, as you all recall, ACIP recommended a two-dose schedule for persons initiating the series before age 15. And uh, there was a policy note uh, published in December. So we have been busy since then. Um, first, there has been a change in a work group chair, and I want to commend Allie Kemp for her scholarly and passionate and very careful leadership of the HPV work group. Now you're stuck with me. Um, we have had monthly conference calls. We've discussed some potential policy issues, and Lori will talk about this a little bit, routine target age wording for the lower age uh, uh, cutoff, 9 to 12 years versus 11 to 12 years and the vaccination series can be started at age nine years. And we've also discussed harmonization of the upper age uh, point for male and female recommendation, and Lori will briefly talk about it. And we've reviewed some other topics and data, the footnotes for the child and um, adolescent and adult schedules, and the nine valent HPV vaccine safety data. So today you'll just hear a very brief update by the work group um, and other uh, regarding HPV related issues. And I wanted to thank the large work group, the ACIP members, Cindy Pellegrini and Jose Romero, 
um, the ex officio members, liaisons, CDC contributors, but most importantly, our fearless leader, Lori Markowitz, who's going to present next. Good evening. <laughs> I'm going to be uh, very brief, as Dr. Salaji said, uh, last session of the day, a long day, busy day. And um, when I'm, I'm going to cover three really kind of separate topics. First, I'm going to review selected CDC and other activities after the two-dose recommendation, and then give an overview of ACIP HPV vaccine workgroup calls and discussions over the last year, and then finally talk about uh, vaccination coverage and impact of vaccination in the United States. And I hope all these things can be discussed uh, further at other meetings. So as mentioned, in October of last year, ACIP voted to recommend a two-dose schedule. The policy note was published uh, two months later. And following that, there were a variety of education and communication efforts to clarify and increase awareness of the new schedule. This included webinars and presentations at scientific conferences, uh, CEC websites and fact sheets were updated, and there was a communication campaign to raise awareness, including digital media outreach to parents and clinicians. Regarding HEDIS, the 2017 HEDIS, which covers the performance period for calendar year 2016, during which time the recommendation was for three doses, um, will not change. But the HEDIS 2018 measure, which covers calendar year 2017, has been updated to reflect the two-dose schedule. The clinic, clinical decision support for immunization services resources, which supports electronic processes that determine the recommended immunizations needed for a patient in health information systems, has been updated for the two-dose schedule. And for vaccine coverage data in NIS, two-dose coverage criteria for NIS teen 2016 were added to the measure for up-to-date coverage, and that will be used going forward, and I'll present some of the NIS teen data uh, later in, in this presentation. So now moving on to the policy issues discussed by the work group over the past year. Uh, there were really two issues. One was the wording for the routine target age group recommendation, and the other was harmonization of the upper age for male and female recommendation. Both of these were mentioned um, a year ago when we were having some discussions with ACIP. So regarding wording for the routine target age group, as you all know, the current recommendation is that ACIP recommends routine vaccination at age 11 or 12, and vaccination can be given starting at age nine years. And this has been the recommendation since the beginning of the US vaccination program in 2006. The potential alternative wording that was discussed was routine vaccination at nine to 12 years of age, which some work group members felt would facilitate vaccine initiation and completion. The work group deliberations include review of the very limited data available on this topic and discussion with work group liaisons and others from AAP. And most work group members favored retaining the current wording of the routine recommendation. And the decision of the work group was not to bring this forward, not to bring any fo forward any change for consideration by ACIP, but ACIP and CDC will ensure that the option for starting the series at H9 will be retained in the, um, and will be evident on, on current schedules and materials as it is now. Deliberations also occurred within AAP and COID, and their recommendation will remain consistent with ACIP. However, in the 2018 Red Book, AAP will recommend starting the series between 9 and 12 years of age at an age that the provider deems optimal for acceptance and completion of the vaccination series. The second policy issue discussed on the work group was harmonization of the upper age for male and female vaccination. And as a reminder, the current recommendation is that ACIP recommends vaccination for females at age, through age 26, and for males through age 21 who were not previously vaccinated. 
And uh, the vaccine is licensed through age 26 for both males and females. Males age 20 through, two, through 26 may be vaccinated. And there's also recommendations for specific groups to receive vaccine through age 26, and this includes men who have sex with men, transgender persons, and males with immunocompromising conditions. The alternative policy that was proposed was harmonization of the upper age for, um, for males and females. And this would both simplify the HPV vaccine schedule, eliminate the need to mention specific groups that should be vaccinated during this five-year period between 22 and 26, and might also facilitate reaching higher-risk groups. And many work group members favor simplification of the immunization schedule through extension of the male age recommendation through age 26 years. And just a little bit of history, in 2011, ACIP recommended vaccination of males for the first time. Vaccination of males was included in the routine immunization schedule. And at that time, GRADE was used for consideration of the evidence and recommendations, which included cost-effectiveness data. And the recommendation for catch-up through age 21 years for males has been in place since that time. And over the past year, the ACIP vaccines work group, while considering this potential policy issue, has reviewed updated cost-effectiveness data, vaccine coverage among males in general and among men who have sex with men. And the work group plans to continue to review this issue and to use the new evidence to recommendations framework and to present this to ACIP in 2018. And then finally, other issues discussed by the work group over the past year were, uh, it was mentioned, uh, simplification of the footnotes of the child, adolescent, and adult schedules, which you'll hear tomorrow, and nine valent vaccine safety. Specifically, the work group heard an update of an ongoing al analysis from the vaccine safety data link on nine valent vaccine, showing no safety concerns, and the immunization safety office plans to present those data to ACIP in February 2018. So my last section is really uh, just a very brief review of vaccination coverage and impact in the United States. And this slide, well known to, to all of you, shows data from NIS teen uh, from 2006 to 2016 for three vaccines recommended for adolescents. And you can see in the orange and the red lines that vaccination coverage in females is increasing, but more slowly than for other vaccines delivered to adolescents. And in 2016, at least one dose coverage for HPV reached 65%, and three dose coverage was 43%. Now, coverage among males, shown in the blue lines, began to increase in 2011 after the uh, routine recommendation for males and reached 56% at least one dose in 2016, and for three doses, 32%. And as you can see, there's been a steeper increase in coverage in males compared to females for the last few years. And between 2015 and 16, at least one dose coverage increased 6.2 percentage points for males and 2.3 percentage points in females. And because of the more rapid rise in coverage among males in recent years, the gap between female and male coverage is narrowing, while the gap in at least one dose coverage was 33% percentage points in 2012. It was only nine percentage points in 2016. And although coverage is still significantly higher in females than males, this year, the CDC calculated overall vaccination coverage among all adolescents, which was 60.4% for at least one dose, 49.2 for at least two doses, and 37.1 for three or more doses. And another new measure that was added this year for adolescents was adolescents that were considered up to date based on at least three doses or two doses according to the new recommendations. And although it's too early to assess direct impact of the two-dose recommendation on practices because the two-dose recommendation was just made at the end of 2016, 
when applied retrospectively, up-to-date coverage increased 6.3 percentage points compared to three or more doses, which was 43.4% in 2016. Now, a, a variety of monitoring efforts on, are ongoing in the U.S., and we presented some of these to you before, and we hope to be able to present them to ACIP in the future. But I wanted to mention today just uh, data from our prevalence monitor monitoring and the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which we've been using since the beginning of the vaccination program to evaluate impact of the vaccination because prevalence will be one of the first outcomes appreciated. And this graph shows vaccine-type prevalence in females and NHANES by era. Pre-vaccine era is in gray, and the early vaccine era is in blue. And four age groups are examined here, shown on the x-axis. And you can see that there is a 56% decrease within the first four years of the vaccination program in 14 to 19-year-olds. And these are our most recent data. We've done several analyses with NHANES. These are our most recent data through 2014 and shows further decreases among females. And this shows the pre-vaccine era in gray, the early in blue, and the more recent through 2014 in red. And you can see now there's a 71% decrease in the 14 to 19-year-olds and a 61% decrease in vaccine type prevalence in 20 to 24-year-olds. Other analyses have also been done uh, in this publication showing herd protection. Um, among unvaccinated females and no evidence of type replacement. And finally, um, our plans for 2018 are to uh, continue reviewing and considering harmonization of the upper age for male and female vaccination, to uh, present to ACIP nine-valent vaccine safety from post-licensure monitoring, and to review impact of HPV vaccination in the United States. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the work group members again and all the CDC contributors. Thank you, Dr. Markowitz, um, for that great and quick presentation. Uh, questions for Dr. Markowitz? Yes, Dr. Hunter. I'm not sure I exactly followed the work group's reasoning on not simplifying the 9 to 12-year-old age range recommendation. Well, we... We have just made a we had just made a major change in our recommendation, which was our two dose schedule, and we have had this routine recommendation at age eleven to twelve when we recommend uh, adolescent platform where other vaccines are administered. And the work group felt that right now the recommendation does allow vaccination at age nine years, so it wouldn't really be any advantage to changing the wording where it's not really changing our recommendation. And we currently have a a, a lot of information out and a, a whole program around 11 to 12 year olds. But you're okay with the AAP saying the same thing in a different way? Dr. Maldonado. I didn't want to have to bring this up again, but since it was brought up, um, the reason we um, have done that, have made that recommendation, and also um, alluding to the issue around catch-up vaccination is that that is one of the, con those are the two concerns that we hear most from our 66,000 members is, well, not all of them, but that's, the, that's what we hear from our membership. Those are two issues that they would like to see clarified, and so we thought at least one of those we could address um, through the Red Book itself, so... And the other, obviously, isn't up to us, so. Thank you. Dr. Salaji. Just a quick response. Um, there are definitely pros and cons of both, like any other decision. But the, um, Allie, you may want to talk about the provider survey, because we actually did have some data about what providers think about, um, or providers who start, you, you know, about the 9 to 10-year-old versus 11 to 12-year-old. And the data that was presented from the provider survey suggested that there was not a big push from pediatric providers about the earlier age group. But we haven't presented that to the full ACIP. Yeah, that was a sort of a rapidly conducted survey to see if we could get a rapid, you know, idea about that. And in fact, most providers 
we're in, we're in favor of keeping things as they are. I do have to say, though, that this is in the context of them doing what they do and worrying, uh, I think, about um, parents who are already concerned about 11 and 12 year olds and even going younger. But I think we have to, uh, that, that issue, you know, in the context of if this were now the norm, it could be, the uh, viewpoints could be quite different. If it were the norm to do this at 9 and 10, then the responses would be, I think, very different. So that was the, the only data we had. Further discussion? All right, seeing none, I think we're done, but for public comment. Is there anyone here uh, for public comment? There's no one signed up, but I want to check. Here's not, and we will have another session tomorrow, so we can save it till then. Have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock.